My name is Sandra Perrone. I am an associate professor teaching photography, philosophy, and honor seminar courses here at STCC. I'm also the gallery coordinator at the Amy H. Carberry Fine Arts Gallery, located in Building 28. The Carberry Gallery exhibitions are intended to foster intellectual engagement and dialogue beyond the traditional classroom. This learning environment attempts to break preconceived notions of a gallery as an exclusive space while sharing who artists are and what they create to inspire students to pursue their creative endeavors and career goals. One of the primary objectives of the gallery is to bring to campus a wide range of media, ideas, artistic practices, which expose students to an array of creative and intellectual work. At STCC, fine arts courses are open to everyone and the importance of visual literacy to every student's overall education, educational experience cannot be understated, no matter their major. This is the fourth virtual event this semester in a series of interviews called Carberry Conversations. Originally conceived in response to the ongoing pandemic, these conversations function as a retrospective of sorts, while also connecting working artists to the greater Springfield community covering a wide variety of topics, including origin stories, the impact of current events on artistic process, the function of art and photography during times of crisis. This morning, I have the pleasure of finally connecting with artist and fellow STCC faculty, Priya Natkarni Green. Originally from New Jersey, Priya lives and works in Springfield where she and fellow artist Andre Green are raising their two children and teaching college level art courses. She has shown her work in both solo and group exhibitions at spaces such as the Kimmel Center Galleries at NYU, Jersey City Museum, uh, uh, Zimarelli Art Museum, Concordia College, and the School of Art Institute in Chicago. She is the recipient of the International Elizabeth Greenshields Foundation grant, as well as a fellowship from the University of Massachusetts. And she was a 2013 artist in residence at the Blue Mountain Center. She received her MFA in painting from the U University of Massachusetts Amherst and her BFA in printmaking from Rutgers University. She has been teaching a variety of art courses since the fall of 2021 here at STCC. So today I am excited to welcome Priya to Stick virtually and talk about her life and her work. Hello, oh, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Priya. I can't believe, I mean, I was thinking about, I've been thinking about this conversation and about how I briefly, briefly met you when uh, Andre had a show at yep. the Carver Gallery. Yeah. Back in 2016. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like <laughs> ages ago now. <laughs> that was a very long time ago. Um, so I I I was just like, wow, but you know, fast forward to um you coming to stick during the pandemic, like yeah. so many people who have come on board uh during the pandemic. I haven't met you in person again. Yeah, 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 that is true. Very <laughs> so, true. So I really thank you for taking the time to, uh, to talk about your work and also, you know, just share part of what you do, you know, uh, in the privacy of, I assume your inner studio right now. I am in um, my studio right now, yep, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, and I also wanted to start uh, the slides off with um, the painting or a painting that I think inspired some of the work, um, yeah. particularly the public art work that you and Andre did, um, this particular one, right. um, yes. which was the last slide when he and I spoke, but I thought, well, this would be interesting because I'll start with the, I'll start with the <laughs> ended with, because it's a continuation of a, of a yeah. bigger conversation, right? Yeah. Um, so, so how did you approach making something this large? Oh boy. Well, this was the largest mural that Andre and I did. Um, we've both done murals before this, but doing it at this scale was a whole other animal <laughs> altogether. So, um, so we had some idea of what it took to make a mural. Um, <clears throat> it is a lot harder than it seems. It's not just, you know, painting on a wall. I mean, there's a lot that goes into just being able to make sure that your design correctly fits the space. And there's a lot of complicated things that logistical things of just painting outside um, mm -hmm. and thinking about, you know, 
having a water source, having electricity, how are we going to get the design on the wall? At this scale, we knew that we had to project the, the image onto the wall. Um, mm -hmm. Also, because I don't know if you can tell from this picture, but it was in a very narrow alleyway. So mm -hmm. that, that added another complicated factor is how we're going to get the distance to actually project onto this large wall. Mm -hmm. And so what we had to end up doing, which we didn't actually come up with this solution until we were in the midst of doing it, but we had to actually project it into pieces because we couldn't get the distance that we needed to be able to see the entire image on the wall at the scale that we wanted. So we had to kind of piecemeal and project um, in different pieces and it didn't line up exactly. And it's just those things are to be expected when you're working outdoors um, in public. There's always unexpected things that you have to kind of maneuver around. So um, we you have to be able to just think on your feet really quick and, you know, be resourceful. So we just sort of figured it out and we're like, OK, if it's not perfect, we can make it look better, like as we're painting it, you know, but we just need to get something on there because, the other thing was that with this particular mural, we were part of a mural festival and that festival was one week. So we had to get this done in a very specific amount of time. And having never worked at this scale before, we didn't know if we would be able to get it done in time. So we just had to make sure that, you know, we could get it done in that week. And we did, we actually finished a little bit early, which was cool. Um, but yeah. So what we're yeah. looking at is about, it's about 50 feet high yes. by, by what, 150 feet long? I think, I think it's 150, either 120 or 150 feet okay. Okay. wide. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so that's kind of a massive uh, quote unquote canvas. Um, can you talk a little bit about the decision to um, uh, use these pageant girls I think yeah These yeah, are yeah. Girls, right? so, in fulcrum which is the the opening slide you know yeah. uh, uh, we see oops I can't go back um we see uh, a sort of headless dancer in a very yeah, bright yeah. dress yeah. with a very back uh, dark um, background and yeah. in this one um we're seeing a, a sort of a, a gradation from very dark dark blue to a lighter blue yeah and two yeah. figures that have actual heads. Can you talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a collaboration between Andre and my, uh, uh, me. So, um, but yes, the, the pageant girls, that, that was something that I was working on in my personal practice. I started painting pageant girls when I was actually a grad student at UMass. I believe one of my thesis paintings or a couple of my thesis paintings had um, images, found images of these pageant girls. And um, a lot of people always ask me, like, were you in pageants? Like, what's your connection to this? And um, no, I wasn't. I wasn't a pageant girl. But um, for me and my work, everything is a metaphor. All the imagery that I use is a metaphor. And um, I was really drawn to these images of they're actually child they're pageant girls they're young children um and I was just drawn to these images and I started playing around with them in photoshop and kind of modifying them and stretching them out and um they just became these really absurd images that I sort of fell in love with because what I realized later was that the thing that I'm interested in is the idea of spectacle and um I connected the dots later on when I started realizing like, oh, what are all these images that I'm drawn to? What's the connecting thread? And I realized it was the idea of like spectacle and performance was something that always had a thread throughout my work. And so that was just something that I was working on personally. And I think that Andre mentioned this in his talk, but for this mural, it was my turn to come up with a design. And, and um, we said that, you know, we wanted the, the murals that we painted to stem from either my work or Andre's work. We wanted it to stem back to what our studio practice was. 
and mm -hmm. that have it not be a separate thing. So um, I was, ju we just used the design based on the work that I was making at the time, which I was painting these pageant girls and the painting that you saw on the previous slide, headless. Um, <laughs> that was because I was painting really just the bodies. Um, and so, <laughs> can't go back. <laughs> How do I go back? How do I go back? Oh, hang on. Maybe we need to exit out of this. And there we go. There we yeah. go. There we go. Okay. There she yeah. is. <laughs> so she's headless, but mm -hmm. she's also footless too. <laughs> right. That's true. Yeah. But the thing that people really see immediately is that there's no head. And I think that's because when we think of a painting of a person, we immediately think of a portrait. And what is a portrait without seeing the face? Um, <laughs> but to me, I didn't want to see these as portraits. I really wanted to see them, as I said before, as like a metaphor for something else. And I felt like if I painted the heads that it would feel too much like, oh, who is like, is this a painting about this specific person? And to me, it was not about the specificity of this person because I was literally finding these images and it was about the image as a found image rather than it being a specific person. And so the mm -hmm. anonymity was important mm -hmm. in, in these paintings. Um, and so, yeah, so for the mural, that was uh, the, the impetus for the design, but um we came up with a compromise of including the heads because we're like well this is a kind of slightly different situation this isn't one of my paintings this is a mural that's going to be seen by mm -hmm. the public and um we also wanted to kind of put a positive spin on it um because we felt like it was important for it to be like a beacon of positivity for people when they when they drive past it or walk past and see it and yeah. so the name of this mural is victory and we were thinking about the idea of there being two winners instead of one winner and like the idea of teamwork and it the spotlight not just being on one person but on two people kind of mm -hmm. apropos because andre and i were working together right, so maybe right. that was like an unconscious thing that we were thinking about yeah. um but yeah let's look at this one now um so in, in, uh, I've been doing a lot of research uh, in preparation for this interview. And one of the things, uh, uh, I think it was a quote that I came across or, or heard was that you said when you were eight years old, you sort of discovered that you really loved painting and drawing. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like what happened? What, what do you think happened in your youth that where you sort of tapped into creativity. Yeah, so uh, I, I talk about this with my parents even to this day, like my desire to, my gravitation towards art is still a huge mystery to all of us. Like we have no idea where that came from. Um, I mean, my, my grandfather was a screenwriter for Bollywood in India. Um, and so there, I think that there was definitely some creativity in the family for sure, but there was no one in our immediate family or maybe even in our extended family that was a visual artist. Mm -hmm. And so I had no real example of that. I don't know where that came from. I mean, of course, going to school here, um, you take art classes and you're exposed to art. So it's not like I didn't have any exposure to it, but I definitely, I had a strong desire to paint and draw. And I asked my mom, like, you know, I want to take painting classes. And just like any kid, like you take different types of classes, you do sports, like they were just like, okay, yeah, you can take painting classes. And I never stopped. I mean, I, I kept doing it until now, you know, like I never stopped painting or making art. Um, so yeah, it's like I said, it's still kind of an anomaly of where I got that from, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I did start, I did start painting from a young age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and you mentioned uh, in this interview that you um, really took to still lives in, uh, in particular. Yeah. 
So, yeah. so we're looking at a still life right now, uh, a, a kind <laughs> of unusual still life. Uh, yeah. You want to yeah. describe this, uh, this particular still life? So this was part of a series where I was painting these mylar balloons. And um, actually what I found fascinating about these particular balloons was that they weren't just balloons, but they were representations of something else, right? Like, so this is mm -hmm. a balloon, but it's also a watermelon. And <clears throat> everything that I painted in this series with this balloon series was a balloon, but then it was also something else. And mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting, like the idea of these two things contained in one. And um, I think that that resonates even to what I'm doing right now in my work, but, uh, yeah, I think that I just found that fascinating. And the idea of these symbols or these icons, like representing something. Again, my work was my work is always talking about something outside of itself. It's not just a one-to-one, -one, oh, this is a painting of a blah, blah, blah. So um, I think that because it was two things in one, it kind of gets to the idea. And then isolating it like this, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't ever see just a single balloon. I mean, there's also something kind of weirdly yeah. depressing about a single balloon, right? It's meant to be part of something else, like a decoration or a party, or mm -hmm. it's not just meant to mm -hmm. be by itself. Right. So right. isolating it in this way, mm -hmm. um, it kind of, sh it just brought a new light to this thing and made, made a conversation piece around this thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it starts a lot of different conversations um yeah let's look at a couple more here's here's a couple uh, more of the balloon series yes. um the the one on the left being the american flag yeah, uh, yeah. in a mylar balloon form yeah 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 <laughs> and the unicorn now here's a question did you actually have these balloons in front of you as you were so some of them i did so mm -hmm. i i really do think that it's important as a painter to learn to paint from life, um, especially because I am and always have been interested in color and light and those types of things. So I think that painting from only ever having painted from an image is not enough. You have to you have to really like when you paint things from life is really when you observe and you really kind of put your observation skills to the test. Mm -hmm. um, but I did not paint all of them from life. I did a combination of painting from life and also painting from images because there were just also conceptually some things that I wanted to paint. And, you know, I after painting some from life, you kind of get an idea for the materiality and how the light plays off of this material. So you kind of can fill in the blanks a little bit and then paint from images. Um, but yeah, for me, I am the kind of person that it's like, well, whatever it takes for me to get to the outcome that I want, like, I'm not going to be a purist about painting from life. And I'm also, I also understand the importance of it, but like whatever I can get to get from A to B is how I'm going to get there with my work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you called these candy coated fairy tales. <laughs> I think that was one of the yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Actually, so... this, this whole quote, the, the moral quandaries that arise through forays of desire, seduction, violence, and power, a perpetual state of warfare that wages on, hidden by promises of candy-coated fa fairy tales and infinite bouts of pleasure, the emotional landscape which yearns for more and is never satisfied. Wow. That, yeah. well, that's, that, that's, oh, those, those are your words, words not mine. Yeah, those are my words, and, <laughs> yeah. I, and I forgot yeah. about them. Yeah, but and I love that they're describing mylar balloons. Like that's what you're describing. Yeah, because they're <laughs> describing these, but they're also describing so much more. And I guess that's why I always see my work as a portrait of something outside of itself. Like mm -hmm. uh, in my work, I'm always responding to whatever experience that I'm having personally or that we are going through collectively, like, you know, as a society, as a country, as a, as a, the world. So all of that stuff just inevitably makes its way into the work, but then it is also about this thing that I'm portraying. Right. And I just, I really, I really don't 
want my work to be literal. Like I really just want it to be uh, like a lens onto something else. And mm -hmm. so I think that there's poetry in that. And so that's what I want painting to be for me really. Mm -hmm. This is another um, uh, series, the next few actually, uh, scissors, fork and light bulb. <laughs> um, and it's kind of just the opposite, right? It's like you've taken all the 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 uh, the background out. You know, you don't know exactly yeah. where these scissors are, um, yeah. because that's not really important. But yeah. um, would you say that this is a representational approach to painting for you? Like when you think, when I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, these are these paintings are super representational. Um, but you know, funny enough, like it, I, I think about um, Francis Bacon's work, like the he has the series of the Pope, and it's like you know they're really disturbing, but they're <laughs> they're like in this kind of blank space, like you don't know where they are, and it's dark, and it maybe references a little bit of architecture, but for the most part, it's like in an abyss. And I thought a lot about what it means to paint something and have it in this abyss. Like it then becomes a psychological space when you really just focus on the object and it doesn't have a context. Mm -hmm. And I think it even points more to being a metaphor when it's, in, you know, when it has no context. So um, I, that just came to my mind just now looking at this because it, you can kind of make out that the, the scissors are on a surface because you see a reflection, but beyond that, you don't know where this is or you don't know what it's doing there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but th yes, these are super representational because I was also just trying to learn how to paint, which might sound strange because it's like, well, I've been painting for so many years, but um, I was like, I, I do, go through these cycles where I just want to paint from observation and almost relearn how to paint or like recalibrate how I see and how that's going to play into how I paint. Mm -hmm. um, so when I did this series of still lifes, I was in that cycle of like I was making a lot of color charts. I wanted to understand the colors that were in my palette and I wanted to rethink about how to observe things. and. Mm -hmm. I noticed that when I always revisit it, that it always kind of progresses and it always changes. I don't always go back to the same way that I was doing things. So it's kind of a way to just also have a check-in point and say, okay, well, how far have I come like in the last five years? So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How important is light in your work? Light is super important. I think light and color are the things that give me the most joy when I'm painting and I'm also they challenge me and I'm always trying to think about how to portray them and I think that's a classic I mean that's been like you know throughout art history that has been the thing right how do we portray light and how do we portray color um <clears throat> especially with painting so that's always that's always just fascinating to me I don't think it'll ever stop to be fascinating for me mm -hmm. um but I can see even looking at these th these are from 2018 so that was what four years ago now mm -hmm. my palette has changed even from then and the way that I think about color and light has changed even from then so um yeah it's interesting and but these yeah, are much these smaller. Oops. Oh boy I did it again. Oh did this skip? I did it again. Oh no that <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, these are very small. These are. Yeah, I was 11. just going to say this is only eleven by fourteen, which you know I I think even eighteen by twenty four uh, you consider small. So <laughs> these are. So do you consider these almost less of paintings and more of sketches, or, or are they really a standalone? Like they're I really, did, you know? I did consider them sketches when I was doing them. Like when I went into the studio to paint them. I just thought of them as studies. And I think maybe that's almost like a psychological thing that I do to myself to feel like it's low stakes. <laughs> and then if I decide it's good enough later, then it's a painting. <laughs> right, right. Well, but, and also um, carving time out in the studio, right? Is like, can be- Yeah, challenging. so 
there was a logistical reason also for me to paint this small was uh, in 2018, my son was an infant at the time. So I think I was still in that place of like, I only have like an hour or two in the studio. Like, you know, I have to find a way to keep painting and keep this thing chugging along, but with, you know, the time constraints that I have. So that was a lot of the reason why I was painting fast. I was painting small. And I had the goal of like, just doing a quick painting every time I went into the studio. And um, and then, you know, and having it be low stakes, I didn't have to feel so much pressure. I could yeah. feel like I'm still doing it, but, you know, it didn't have to be anything. There wasn't that many expectations I put on myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So this is this is a fork. And it's also your you can see a lot of your brush strokes, you know, so you're yeah. definitely like pushing paint around. And you're getting this reflection so you're you're grappling with the light and you're doing it it looks like it's it is quick and yes. just, because it had to be maybe you know your yeah. son was only napping for an hour that day exactly yeah <laughs> yeah you're getting exactly. it in while you can um this is a, a departure we're going to go from from forks <laughs> studies <laughs> of small studies of forks to a much larger piece um 30 by 24 inches of yeah flowers or fragments of flowers or uh, fragments of a windowsill um and then of course i can't help but notice the date uh 2020 so do you want to talk a little bit about how this kind of still life came into being yeah so uh at this point i felt i was done with all those series of painting still lifes and i and of course this was during covid so i was at home a lot <laughs> observing my my house and my domestic space. And this is something that physically exists in my house or did with the flowers. Um, but that window still is in our, in our dining room. And uh, I think this was in the winter because, you know, in the winter time in Massachusetts at dusk, there's this really, really blue light. The sky turns this amazing blue and I would notice this blue light coming in and I, I started thinking a lot about the relationship between that blue light and then the blue light of our devices like there's blue light everywhere at this time you know especially because during COVID and there's so much that happens through a screen and that blue light so I started making these connections between the blue light and then blue became a really important color and it still is a very important color for me in my work right now. Um, but this was just, uh, I, would, I was taking pictures of these flowers and they eventually died and I was still taking pictures of them as they were dying. And uh, I, I was working with collage a lot when I was in grad school and I stopped and, this time I wanted to return to it because I felt like there was a lot of things happening during COVID thinking about time and also our space, you know? And um, I think that that sort of cubist collage like way of breaking up the picture of space is, it really makes you think about time and space and, and the way that like for the whole world, time and space was kind of being rattled. And so I wanted to make a return to that. And I was, uh, this was a combination of like looking from life, but also working from the different images and how these flowers changed over time. And that fragmentation, the fragmentation of time and the fragmentation of space, um, these are not new concepts, but like for me, I was rediscovering them in my work. Yeah. And so, and also just really limiting the palette. I started really limiting the palette at this time. And what that means is just using very few colors. And I wanted to see how colorful I could make something with very few colors. And that was my challenge to myself. Like, how do I portray color and light with least amount of colors on my palette possible. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so that has really informed the way that I work even now is thinking about um, working from imagery and really reducing down the amount of colors and the amount of contrast. And it, so 
that these paintings were important because they led to where I am right now with my work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is another departure, but it's all in the same year. Um, uh, yeah. 2020 was a big year, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, but this this painting, I think, was also a big deal, uh, right, for you, because it was a commissioned piece. Um, yeah. By the University um, Museum. Uh, yeah, so um, the University Museum of Contemporary Art, which is at UMass, uh, my alma mater, they um, invited me uh, to be part of this show there's um something called for freedoms which is it's kind of a national it's an organization but they do uh shows it's like an artist run uh organization and they just have artists from around the country responding to the concept of freedom and so the museum at the time was uh going to have a show part of that installment and they invited myself as well as Andre to make work specifically about this topic and then it was part of the exhibition and then um, the piece is now part of their collection at the museum mm -hmm. um, so I wanted you know I really loved the, the the prompt because this is something that I'm always thinking about and I felt like the perfect moment to for me to start steering my work back to thinking about these things but I didn't want to leave the stuff that I was doing before because I felt like I was doing a lot of really important investigating with the, all my previous work so imagery wise it is different from the flowers but in terms of like a technical narrative and the way that I'm constructing space and color it's really not that different. I mean, it's the same fragmentation. And I was thinking about the blue and, you know, breaking up the space. And so all of those things are still there. It's just that the imagery itself changed to something else. Um, right. So we're looking at, uh, if people can't tell already, we're looking at a um, toy rocking horse, but that has been broken up, right? Um, yeah. So you have this 17th century toy. <laughs> you know, in there with juxtaposed against the Samuel Jackson. Um, Andrew Jackson. Andrew, yeah, that's right. Andrew, Andrew Jackson, Jackson monument. monument in front of the White House. Yeah. With, at the time was uh, there were attempts to actually like literally pull it off of its. Yeah. Perch, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So, so we have these two things, but they're broken up. So you don't see either of them in, in sort of a complete form. Right, right. And so I wanted to think about because a lot of a lot of monuments were being toppled, not just in the US, but around the world, you know, and there was like something in the air. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that, you know, like not just political situations, but even just COVID and like everything that was going on at the time was resulting in something that was in the air that was affecting the entire world. And so I was fascinated by that and I was fascinated by the monument toppling and it, I was fascinated from a sense where I didn't necessarily agree with it or disagree with it. I just thought it was like a fascinating concept because um, what something that I said at the time when I made this piece was like the that the idea of fantasy or that an ideal like idealism is involved not just in the making of these monuments but also in the toppling of them and so there's something on either side that there's like a shared there's something shared on the both extremes and that is what I found really interesting and then also thinking back to uh the balloon paintings I was again fascinated by uh, this idea of an object that is really something else so it's you know, it's not a, just a balloon, it's a watermelon. And this is not just a statue, but it's a horse. And same with the the, the toy rocking horse. Mm -hmm. And this idea of two things in one and um, thinking about like, you know, the two extremes of the spectrum and like how they can just be collapsed into one thing. I was just fascinated by that. And I didn't necessarily have any answers, but painting was my way 
of confronting this thing and dealing with it and trying to like discover make my own discoveries within it you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that was that was like the impetus behind this painting and I was thinking about just how that has to do with our ideas of freedom and um how freedom can be completely interpreted it can be interpreted completely differently by different people um so that was my response to the prompt Mm -hmm. and it this led to a lot of the works i'm doing now too so Mm -hmm. it was important yeah so um, <clears throat> we're into 2021, uh, more recent, um, but the events are uh, from the same period of time, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when you think yeah. about this one is New Delhi 2021, um, and uh, without even knowing the title, uh, I think a, a viewer might be aware that this is a scene um, at night, that perhaps there are fires, or there's people running, or there's some sort yeah. of emergency flashing light. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, you're not sure because there it's it's not explicit, um, but it's suggestive. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, can you talk a little bit about uh, how these current events, uh, like the farmers' protests um, in India, which actually started in 2019 yeah. and are still going on today, uh, yeah. where tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are still protesting um, uh, certain laws around uh, farming, um, but how 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 do current events impact you? So, as, as a painter. So uh, again, it's like painting is my way of reconciling with things that are happening. And my stance is that no matter how much information we're getting or we think we're getting about what's going on in the world, we don't really know like what's actually happening. I don't think anyone really knows. It's kind of like we're all just grasping in the dark, trying to figure out. And so that to me was so fascinating because we live in this age of information where we're constantly inundated by information and we think that we're informed, but we actually know very little and are not able to predict the future. Or, you know, it's like, there's so much that we don't know. And so, that dilemma, which I think is very much part of the human condition and it's highlighted so much as a 21st century being is really what these works are about. So it's like, I was using these images that I was finding in the news. I was fascinated by the fact that there's the largest protests I think that in history were happening in India. Mm-hmm. And my family is from India. So I have like, like, my ears go up if I, if I, you know, maybe more than any, any other person who may not have ancestry from there, but it's like, I was fascinated that there was this thing going on there. And then there were also protests happening here. And it was like the simultaneity of it. I found fascinating. And I also was thinking about how so much of what I'm perceiving about what's happening in the world, and maybe for most of us, is through a device. Right. It's we're experiencing these things secondhand or even thirdhand. We're not experiencing them firsthand. And yet it informs so much about our worldview and mm-hmm. you know our our personal experiences, our opinions, our values, et cetera, et cetera. And I just I feel like that is a perfect portrait of the human condition in the 21st century. It's like not experiencing things firsthand, but it is your reality. And and so for me, these paintings are about that feeling. And that is why they're all blue because blue is really a color of distance. I mean, if you think about even just atmospheric perspective and seeing something far away in the landscape, it appears more blue. And so it's like, then also the blue light of our devices and seeing things through that blue light, I was making those same connections that I was making 
with the pic the painting of the flowers the fragmented flowers like what's the connection between experiencing these things through the blue light of our devices and it, it's like these things that we're not physically experiencing are so much a part of our reality and that was the phenomenon really that i was trying to understand and paint about so like these images that i'm painting are really more than the images themselves it's like the interruptions and the color and the way you have to get through to these images is really the meaning of the work it's that obscurity and that distance mm -hmm. um and i think that we all have collectively been feeling it so so strongly in these last couple of years and this really was my way of again, reconciling with it and confronting yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. This is another example from the um, from this larger series, because there's many of these, um, but this is Mumbai 2021. And I think we're seeing a car or something on fire. Although yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a dumpster. Yeah. Dumpster, okay, okay. It's hard to tell. Um, and then we see cars in the distance, and then we have this um, this pink line in in the in the New Delhi one, you had a very um, bright red line. Can you talk yeah. about using that um, as as a visual? Yeah. So I became interested in these very stark interruptions. Um, like I didn't. Again, I didn't want to just paint a one to one. Oh, this is like an image of something that's happening, you know, like an event that's happening. I, because mm -hmm. to me, that was what the, the photograph was doing. The photograph had that function. So if I'm painting this now, what is the painting then going to do with it? And so, um, not just that it gets obscured in paint and color, but I also wanted to interrupt it in some way that made, made you kind of kind of like take a second look at this thing and so I started like masking off these areas so that pink that you're seeing is the ground that I start off with I start off with a very saturated ground and then I paint on top of that and so I started taping off and masking off the ground painting on that and then revealing those pieces after the painting was dry Mm -hmm. And it just, it gives this really stark interruption. And to me, I felt like that was also another conceptual metaphor for thinking about how we, how we experience these things. Like I'm, and how many times removed now is this event because it's been photographed. It's been, I've seen it through my device mm -hmm. and now I'm painting it and obscuring it again. It gets even further removed and then putting these interruptions possibly even further removes it again so it's again that that act of distancing from it because um mumbai is like a place where my mom's side of the family lives there and is from there but like seeing this image like i I feel like maybe I'm supposed to have a connection to what's happening there, but I don't, you know, cause I'm still only experiencing these things again in this very removed way. Right. So right. Right. I think it, it's, it has a lot to do with that too. Mm -hmm. And I feel even the same with the stuff that's happening here. It's like that same removal. Like I'm not experiencing these things firsthand or even secondhand. It's like that same distance. Yeah, yeah. Here's an uh, example, uh, another example, um, Pittsburgh, 2021. Similar, similarly, very blue. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's that luminosity, right? That that yeah. is coming off of the painting that when I first looked at your work and I made sure not to look at any titles, I didn't read any statements. I just looked at the work and yeah. I, I was like, I have seen this before, but I haven't seen this before. You know, like I, yep. I have, I have witnessed this protest, but I haven't witnessed this protest. You right. know, like exactly. I've never been to Pittsburgh, but I, I feel like I have seen this, this view of Pittsburgh where it's yeah. dark, it's smoky. There's perhaps um, uh, uh, people running or walking, or and they're in the street because you, you do see this sort of double yellow line. 
And then again, we're using that red line that's really, really powerful um, that breaks up that space and reminds you um, that this is a painting. Yeah, yeah, yes. And, and that is the other function, I think, of seeing these interruptions is that, like you said, it reminds you that this is a painting. Mm -hmm. It's not even the thing itself and it's not even the photograph of the thing. It's a painting. It's my construction of this thing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm glad that you said that, but that, yeah, the blue light, the luminosity. I mean, we are always looking at an illuminated surface yeah. all the time. I'm looking at an illuminated surface right now. <laughs> I'm not actually looking at the painting. I'm looking at the image of it through a screen. Yeah. And it's like, so we we can't get away from that. And I, for me, I want, um, like it's really important for me, and maybe this is the purest side of me as a painter, but I want the experience of seeing these paintings in real life mm -hmm. to deliver more than what you could have thought it could deliver through seeing it through a screen. And I think that they do. I think it's really important to see them in person. Um, but we've also, our eyes have just um, unconsciously been trained to see in very specific ways because we're always looking at illuminated devices, you know? Mm -hmm. Over the last 10 years, we've been, you know, 10 or more years, we've been training our eyes to see things in terms of light in a way that we didn't do that before we used to have smartphones and only be looking at our laptops all the time. So um yeah it's 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 really interesting you know like just thinking about the way that we see and I, I think that influences a lot of the way that I paint these paintings and and make these works that mm -hmm. that's a really important part of it are we going to be seeing any of these in person do you have any shows on the horizon like do you have so any at, places you yeah. want these paintings to be in person so this painting and another one in this series is actually at the Ely Center of Contemporary Art right now in New Haven. Um, it's going to be showing there till the end of April. So if anyone makes it down to New Haven before the end of April, they have particular hours so you can check on their website. But um, mm -hmm. these paintings are there right now. And funny enough, they put them in a room. And I thought this was really interesting. Um, they put them in a room with a video installation so the room is dark and there's a video projection on the wall and then next to that is these paintings mm -hmm. with the light shining on them and they were illuminated in a way that I hadn't seen them in that way yet before and I thought it was fascinating because you know the person who installed the show and curated the show was obviously trying to make a connection between these paintings and a video projection. And that's exactly what my work is about. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and I don't know if they you know, knew that much about my work to, to make that much of a connection, but mm -hmm. yeah, so it, it's, it's interesting to see them installed in that way. And um, mm -hmm. this is the other one also. That's yeah, that. this is Raleigh, Raleigh, North Carolina, yeah. Um, yeah. from to also 2021, but you're referencing events prior to that, right? I mean, this is- yes. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking at a similar palette in terms of those very dark blues. Yeah. Um, and, and, and into light blues, which make it really sort of mysterious and um, a little ominous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you don't really know what's going on. You see and like- don't know what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, you're like, I see, I think I see a person, but I'm not sure. And then I maybe am seeing a couple motorcycles in the street, but I don't see anybody else. And um, there's nothing actually, I mean, when you look at the image, it's not anything you can put your finger on and say, oh, this is like something dangerous, but it has that feel to it. And it's probably because we have seen these images over and over again. They're in our consciousness and they now dictate the way we see things. So yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's why we can make that connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when I think about your work, um, and, and then I also think about like 
how do you as a as an artist and an educator what like how do you inspire your students to tap into those things that are important to them you know these events obviously have made an impact on you and, yeah. and visually like these photographs or that you're seeing certain scenes like and so you're you're trying to understand your world through your paintings right and so uh, yeah. how do you how do you convey that to students who are starting out and maybe you know they're they're needing some technical skills but they also have a lot of things to say uh, yeah well i think it really helps to just look at contemporary artists and see how they uh, are making work and how they talk about all the things that are happening. And it doesn't necessarily have to be current events, right? I mean, whatever it is that is important to that person that is important enough to put out there and make work about. I think that um, when you're a student, you're you're still getting your voice. You know, you maybe even haven't found your voice yet. Um, it's really important to see that blueprint and those examples of people that are doing it and to see what's possible. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that you have to emulate exactly what they're doing, but it like it, it inspires you to think about, well, what's my voice? Mm -hmm. And in, in a lot of ways, I'm still trying to figure out what my voice is, you know, I don't think that ever stops as an artist, but mm -hmm. I think that um, exposing them to contemporary art and just mm -hmm. art in general is really what um, makes all these things feel more tangible, of how mm -hmm. you can talk about these things and how you can make art about these things. This is another example, uh, Smoke and Mirrors 2 from 20, uh, 2021. Yeah. Um, this one's even harder to read in some ways, right? You've changed the palette, right? It's a little bit more green than blue, although there's still yeah. some blue. Um, and then you have these yellow, it almost looks like vinyl, <laughs> like um, placed yeah. over, over the image. But then I'm like, but is that a person? But I think I see a horse head, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> It, it's great because it keeps me looking and guessing and yeah. I, go, I go from edge to edge and all over and I'm just like, okay, what is it that I'm looking at? But then I look at the title and I'm like, oh yeah, smoke and mirrors, you know? So it's, it's, it's maybe some of it's real, maybe some of it's imagined. Right. Yeah. I think that's the goal for me. It's always to make work that's slightly mysterious <laughs> because <laughs> you don't want, you don't ever want someone to just look at Eric and be like, okay, and then move on, you know, like you want it to be food for thought. And mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, it's funny that you said horse head because someone else had the same reaction when they saw it. And that's actually not what it is. It's actually a, just another side of another person, their arm bent, but it's oh. fragmented in a way where it does look like a horse head. So it's funny. Um, but yeah, with this one, I really wanted to just play even more with pushing things around to the point of obscurity and really not knowing mm -hmm. what is happening. Um, <clears throat> I really feel like maybe, I, I don't know, towards the end of my career or even sooner, I might just go completely abstract. <laughs> Isn't that what happens to every representational artist? <laughs> they just go completely abstract um, yeah. because, yeah, it it's just feels like the natural That's evolution. where it's going, huh? That's where it's that's <laughs> Yeah. Where it's going. Um, and then we have this one, which I think is behind you. Yes, is it, it is. <laughs> yeah. that one so, yes. so um, can you talk, so is this, this is still in progress or is this? This one is finished. Yeah, it's finished. It's just hanging in my studio because it's so big. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. This one's finished and again, I'm still interested in painting monuments, mm -hmm. sculptures in particular, um, because of this idea of ekphrasis. Ekphrasis is this term of like an one art form describing another art form. So like if you were to make a painting about a song or a dance about a poem, you know, that's kind of a very basic example, but um, I just really like the idea of like 
removing things by these steps even further. I mean, you'll see that's a theme throughout my work. So, um, you know, it's it's not really a horse, it's a sculpture of a horse and then I'm painting it. So it's like those kind of removals because I, again, feel like those removals are really a metaphor for all the things that I'm talking about with, mm -hmm. with when we're talking about current events and how we perceive things. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are just recurring things that come up. And then this, you know, I was still thinking about the monument toppling and the in this painting, the monument is not being toppled. It's just there. But then there's this interruption in front of it. And so this painting is really what I've been working on lately with these very elaborate masks. And then there's two paintings within one painting. Mm -hmm. So the the red area that is within this mask, that was actually an old painting <laughs> that I wasn't happy with. And then I masked it out and then painted another painting on top of it. And then I was like, when I did that, I was like, oh, this is it. Like, this is, this is what everything has been building up to is like this idea of two things being contained in one. There's two paintings literally in one painting. Yeah. And you have to see it through this portal. So I don't know if you can see it, but these, the mask, the shape of that silhouette, is actually those flowers that were on my windowsill. Mm -hmm. And this is like, you know, the dying version of them. Because that that image of the flowers on the windowsill was like a pivotal moment for me conceptually that I just had to reuse it. And mm -hmm. I'm reusing it in this way where it becomes a portal to look at this painting, which is behind the other painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, and so this is what I'm doing currently with my work is making a painting and then masking it out and then putting another painting on top of it and then seeing what the result is of that. Because mm -hmm. I'm not always exactly sure how it's going to turn out, but that is exciting to me. Yeah. I have one last question uh, before we sign off. And yeah. uh, that is, um, what advice would you give uh, your younger self? If you mm. could have could have given yourself as a young artist or a young person? That is a very good question. Um, I think that, you know, at some point you kind of have to block out all the voices, all the external voices of what other people tell you and find out what your voice is and let that voice become loud enough where you start to understand what it is that you have to do. Um, I think it's really hard to understand what your purpose is if you don't allow that voice that's inside of you to really be heard. And it can be really easy to, to hear everybody else's voice, right? Especially nowadays. I can't imagine for someone who's 20 right now, what it must be like. Um, I really just missed, I mean, I'm technically a millennial, but I'm an older millennial. So I did grow up with like social media to some extent, but not the way that, you know, young people have it now. So it's so hard to block out those voices. Mm -hmm. And I still battle with it, you know, I'm still constantly comparing myself. But I think you will be happiest when you just realize it. What is your voice? And like, how do you let that voice be louder than all the other voices? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And figure out what it is that you want to do. I think that's the advice I would give my younger self and also any students that are watching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Listen to yourself. Trust yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Listen to that voice. And, and it's, it's sometimes it is about shutting out those other voices to be able to do the kind of work that you're doing. Yes. And it's not to say that there aren't people who are helpful, you know, like you don't want to disregard people that can actually inspire you and mm -hmm. help you along your path. But at the end of the day, especially to be an artist, it's just you alone. I mean, like, even if you decide to collaborate with someone, you have to first have your voice and know what that voice is. Mm -hmm. And I've had to go through a process like throughout schooling and even after schooling of just shutting out 
those voices and really trying to understand what am I trying to say and how is it different from what other people are doing? Well, Priya, I want to thank you so much for such a candid conversation. And I look forward to both seeing you in person again at some point. <laughs> Yeah, and I am really looking forward to seeing your work in person as well, because I that think would be awesome. it yeah. would be awesome. And so I hope we can make that happen at the gallery someday, um, you know, when things because we're starting, you know, the world is starting to open back up. Yeah, yeah. And it's great that some of your work is even in a in a space right now that people can. Yeah. Sit. And so every day, you know, we're moving towards trying to get back to some semblance. Yeah of, of we're uh, getting there. <laughs> yes, we are getting there so I thank you so much for sharing today and um, we will look forward to to your next work thank you so much thanks for having me you're welcome